Hey guys, this is Andrew Holmes. We're on Real People with Real Deals and we're here with Rahul Weisel. And this is a story of an engineer. How do you retire at 40 with real estate? So Rahul, welcome to Real People, Real Deals. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Definitely. So Rahul, let's kind of start from the very beginning, mm -hmm. uh, which is how did you end up in America? I came uh, in the United States in, back in 99. Uh, the whole point of coming here was to uh, get into a good career, get, get into a good job. And that was the, uh, the main uh, objective. I got a job in uh, Boeing. Okay. Uh, for every engineer, uh, it's like a dream come true. Like you're trying to work for the uh, company which makes the uh, airline or the, or the plane. Um, you dream of that as a mechanical engineer. So that was my uh, uh, dream come true kind of a job to come to US. So if I roll the clock back a little bit backwards, right? Um, you became an engineer. Mm -hmm. Was engineering a choice? Did you consider any other careers at that time? Um, how did you end up being an engineer? No, it's like back in India, you know, like uh, the the kids here get a lot of uh, information these days. The only information we get back in India is the parents want you to become either doctor or engineer. So, so at that time you had two choices. Two choices, right? pick yeah, pick one. Because that's where you can get a job and get a good career, stable life. So all the parents in India wants those two profession. Uh, for me, uh, I seen most of my uncles or my uh, elder brothers doing engineering. So let's do engineering. There's, there's no choice like that. So. Right. so it was basically pick one out of two, yeah. you chose engineering. Yeah. So when you chose engineering, at where did this bug of entrepreneurship kind of you know, get into you? Did you read a book? How did you, where did you come up with this idea? No, it's like, I finished my engineering, which right. my dad wanted, and I ran away. You ran, ran away, away from home? Ran away from home. Because I said, I did the thing which you wanted, now I'm an engineer now, so let me do something which I want, and he was not ready to listen, so I said, let me do something. So uh, one of my uncle who lives like 200 kilometers from the city which I live, um, he has a, a, a machine shop. So he does machining components, it's a small business. I said, I want to go there, I'm going to learn there. So I started my first job, 400 rupees, which is like in today's dollars, five bucks for a month. Uh, so that was my first job. And I was trying to learn the business. I was, my thinking was, let me work there six months, learn all the things, and then I start my own business. Um, so that was kind of the first seed. Yes. But at somewhere along the way, you get me read, Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, Boeing, you applied, obviously Boeing offers you a job in America and you kind of came here like most immigrants chasing the American dream. Yes. Basically. Right. So what did you think about being an engineer? Did you like being an engineer? How was that? See, um, I like engineering because the basically I'm a I'm a guy who will uh, who wants to design, who, who has ingenuity, who wants to uh, make the life better, those kind of things. I I always worked in the new product development part of it. So, which is not like a job where you do and do the same job every day. So, I like my engineering career. Um, I literally uh, loved it every day, going to office, trying to do, uh, develop new ideas. Um, so, after Boeing, I, I joined Caterpillar. Um, I have three patents. Uh, so, I enjoyed my work. I was blessed to get uh, uh, good projects, which uh, actually I can improve the things, and um, it was uh, it was patented. Um, so I'm proud of my work. Uh, okay. So you come here, you get a job at uh, at Boeing, mm -hmm. and then did your wife move here with you? How did that transition happen? Well, it's a it's a funny story, or maybe a sorrowful sorrow story. But uh, I came here before because we had enough, only that much money to come. I didn't have money for her because the job which I got, they are not paying for her ticket. So I cannot bring her on. So I came here and then worked for a few months, uh, saved some money, and then I brought my wife uh, uh, from India. So you literally had enough money saved up, you send a ticket to India, she comes over here. Yes. What happens next? Um, the whole point of our, for her to bring, because that was our first anniversary back in, uh, uh, 99 August 10th August uh, that's my marriage anniversary so she came over on the 5th of 6th of August and on 10th August Monday I went I, I'm going to uh, I, I went to my job at Boeing um, and I get a good news my boss called me I said okay how he knows that I have 
uh, anniversary today that he's going to congratulate me that at, uh, it's your first marriage anniversary your wife is here how you're enjoying and then i go uh, to his cabin and he said unfortunately uh, you're one of those fortunate people who are going to lose your job today so th this is the massive layoffs this is right? a massive layoff and boeing got mcdonald douglas got merged into boeing uh, the deal was to keep all the employees from Douglas. So that 20,000 employees which are coming in Boeing has to stay. So 20,000 people from Boeing has to leave. Uh, so it's not about your skill set, not about what you're doing. It's about the business decision that you're part of the, that 20,000. They have to leave the office. How did you feel in that time? That's where you feel like, okay, uh, that's one of my, like a low point in my life. That's when I felt like, I did everything right. I did what my dad wanted me to do. I uh, did good in my studies. Uh, I was working hard uh, to keep my job, uh, but it's nothing in your hand. It's like you feel like somebody else is uh, driving uh, your destiny or somebody else is making contr uh, controlling your destiny uh, and you're, you don't have any control on, on your own future. So you basically felt like helpless, right? Yeah, where basically that. Uh, where somebody else, doesn't matter how well you perform, what you did in school, nothing counted. Even if you worked at your job really hard, it's just that somebody else made a business decision and that was that. Exactly. So let's fast forward that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's back in 99. Mm -hmm. Did you jump into real estate at that point? What did you end up doing? No, I was not because that was not the choice for me because uh, new in a country, no savings. The day I uh, sent my uh, wife all the savings, uh, when I got my notice in my hand, I had $300 in my account. Um, and then I'm trying to find a new job now. Uh, found a job in Chicago, uh, but two weeks, no payment. I'm, I'm flying without any uh, money in my pocket. So I could not just jump into something because I was not ready. I have responsibility of my wife uh, who just came over. Uh, so I took a job. So I went in another career uh, with Caterpillar that time. Um, so I went back, but from that day, uh, when my layoff happened, every day I was thinking, okay, today might be the day. Um, so that fear was- coming. Every every anniversary is like a black day. What happens on the second anniversary or third anniversary? It's like, uh, it it became a joke in my uh, in my friend circle. Like they're, they're checking with me, are you still employed? And then they're going to congratulate me on my anniversary. So that was the, it was funny, but it's still when when it, it happens, uh, you kind of keep checking yourself. Okay, what do you want in the future? Where do you want to go from here? So you always had that bug, right? Yes. The bug of entrepreneurship. So we kind of rolled the clock forward, right? Um, and when did you first start investing in real estate? So the first time is uh, when I met you. Uh, this was the first two properties which I bought was February 11. Uh, 2011. 2011. Yes. So before February 2011, right? Did you look into other businesses while oh, you were yeah. working at Caterpillar? Okay. What kind of businesses did you look at? All those 10 years, every year I was trying to come up with a new idea and trying to go to a bunch of seminars and finding that quick solution to quit your job and uh, tried medical billing, tried, uh, tried the income tax with uh, it, um, uh, that H and B or whatever that is, and then H and R. Uh, then, uh, obviously, being an Indian, uh, looked into subways and looked into the Dunkin' Donuts, those Dunkin businesses. Donuts, right? yeah, that's yeah. Those are the businesses which right. I can see all the Indians doing, so maybe I should do it too. Yeah. But nothing worked out, nothing, uh, because at, at the same time, it's all about numbers to me. And uh, I, I needed something which is like, uh, which is close to me and which needs to give me money. Uh, long term and not like a short term solution. So nothing nothing came out of that. So 2011, you start investing in real estate, yes. right? And when you started investing in real estate in 2011, did you start with wholesale? Did you start with uh, flips or did you start with rentals? Means, uh, no, with rentals. And there's a reason why I started rentals. My job was good. I didn't want money that moment. I didn't want to make more money. like by flipping houses, getting maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars That was not my... Now, uh, when you say a good job, right? Just yeah. for people who are watching this or listening to this, 
uh, this was engineer salary, right? You're yeah. making enough money, you're yeah. living well within your means, yeah. right? But it wasn't like you had some job that was paying you three, four hundred thousand dollars. No, nothing like that. I mean, so I'm in a career for let's say seven or eight years that time or ten years at Caterpillar. Uh, especially coming an uh, immigrant coming out, it's always a difficult task to get uh, to a point where you, you can really get a lot of money. So no, it was uh, it was like less than hundred thousand at that moment too. Right. So, so I was just right making around around, kind of yeah around close, that money. Okay. Uh, but it was enough for for I had two two kids by that time, and that's another responsibility added on in those ten years, uh, which I I'm looking now. Okay, how I can go, take this? Uh, how I can pay for their education, pay for everything. Uh, their uh, their weddings, marriage, and all that stuff. So, uh, I would say I've uh, I started real estate by accident. My in, my thinking was investment, not a business. So my thinking to you uh, when I came to you, I said, okay, I have two kids, and I have saved up enough money in last ten years where I can uh, I want to put that money in some place where it will grow and not go down like stock market because that happened to me also. I tried that too. And uh, obviously, for every like everyone, I lost good um, chunk of money in stock market. So that's not something uh, which I want to uh, invest on. So I wanted something which is going to grow. So by the time they get to uh, with two kids, with they with they come to the college age, I can actually uh, sell the properties and start paying for their uh, the college education. So it is investment which started. It was not a business that time. So you basically the thought was I'll buy two houses. Yeah. I can have them paid off by the time they get to college. Yes. And then uh, when I need the money, I can sell the properties and uh, pay, for uh, pay for the college. Yes. Now from there, from two simple rental properties uh -huh. to today, uh, at 40 years old, right? You were able to retire, right? Sure. Um, so and that was about five, six, four, five years ago, right? Yeah. Uh, that you were able to walk away from a job, right? At 40. That's a long step, right? Yeah. From just two houses to 40. So um, how did that happen? What was the, because you follow a formula, right? Uh, which at the time I didn't know, today we call it two, five, seven. Exactly. Two years, five houses, yeah. pay them off in seven, right? And you're kind of the poster child uh, that used that formula, right? Um, so from two, let's talk about till the time you retired. Mm -hmm. So you retired at the time you had what, about 20 houses? Yeah, 20 houses. About 20 houses yeah. you reti retired. Um, how did you get from 2 to 20? You had that kind of savings or kind of talk us through the process. No, it, it's not the savings. So the first two houses, let's go back to the first two in investments. Uh, the money came from uh, the money which I saved up was in the, my house. So I, instead of instead of paying the interest, uh, my Indian mind is, okay, why to pay interest when I have money? So I keep paying my house down uh, because I have, ne I have not a better use of money. So why not to just pay around the house? So I took the home equity line of credit. So I want to put this in relation to mm -hmm. people that are listening. This is 2011. Yes. So 2008, 9, 10, 11, the market is still at the bottom yeah. of this whole thing. Right. This is when you decide, OK, this is a bright idea yeah. of what Andrew was telling me. And I'm going to basically yeah. and it was faith. Yeah. Part of it was faith and part of it was hopefully numbers that made right. sense to you. Numbers is what actually made sense. Means obviously I've seen some of your previous projects uh, which you're doing with other people. I saw the success there. So I had a little bit uh, credibility from there uh, for you. And then the second thing was the numbers. Uh, uh, means I did the numbers like 10 different ways to look at and it keeps coming and showing me, okay, the, the, the investment looks good. I can make 20, 30, 40% uh, uh, investment. So it was a difficult situation, a difficult choice, but I, I was ready to do the, do the thing because based on numbers. So the first thing you had basically, your savings plan was that any little money you had, you tried to pay down your house, pay down your house, pay down your house. Yes. And at the time your house wasn't fully paid off, no. right? You had about 90,000 debt or so, but you had about um, what is it? 80,000, 90,000? Yeah, around 100,000 was in the house, equity, equity, yes. equity in the house. Um, so that's the money which I took the home equity HELOC basically uh, loan out and bought the first two properties. So, okay, so, so you take 90,000 yeah. from your house. Yes. You buy two properties. Yeah. Okay, and then what was the next step? So this is like one of those things when everybody will get that in their, in their life, that it's like a, a light goes on kind of thing. So. 
I was only following your um, your advice to buy the properties and uh, this is a good area location. So I'm not, I was not really uh, expert that time to make those decisions. So I relied on your expertise on that. I relied on my number expertise on my side. What happened was we, we basically bought two houses. We rehab those houses. After rehab, uh, we put tenants in there and now it becomes an investment property. Uh, it was a foreclosure before. Now you added the value. Now the investment property is making money. So then we went to the bank and uh, asked the bank, okay, these are the houses which are making money. How much money we can get out of it? So, so you refinanced. The so we refinanced the money out. So they gave us a 75% on appraised value, um, which surprisingly, so my all-in cost or all-in cost that time was 110,000. So you buy the property. You rehab the property. Mm -hmm. You are in that property for about 110. This is two, two houses, properties, small two houses. properties, small little townhouses, right? right? Uh, for about 110. Right. So these are small little rental property. Yeah. One was two bedroom, one was three bedroom. These are like those uh, fourplex buildings where you have sure. a special and like a, a private entrance, uh, those kind of houses. Uh, you're getting rents around 1250, 1350, uh, like 1250 for a two bedroom, 1350 for a three bedroom, uh, and uh, that was the that was the, the setup. And so you refinance it, you refinance your 110 out, yes. and on top of that, you had 25, 30% equity on top of it. Yeah. So it's a great investment any which way, right? So you refinance it all, now you have the 90,000 back, which you had borrowed from your home equity. And now, uh, I still remember this conversation because you're like, man, I was able to buy them, rehab them, every month it makes seven, 800 bucks. How about if we do it once more and it was kind of uh, two kids at the time saying oh my god right we found uh, cookies right exactly. uh, that nobody knew that uh, was there and so you rinse and repeat the same process like i said it's it's a funny day was like when we got the money back i was doing the final calculations and i looked at the numbers like we we put 110 we got 110 back we are getting almost 700 dollars every month uh, after paying off the principal exactly. interest and all expenses and all my money is back to me again. So what is the harm in just doing this again and again and again, repeat the same process? And that's what we did. And uh, fortunately for us, uh, market was how much money you can bring. Cash was king that time. So you have cash, you'll get the properties. So, so two, you go to four. Four, you go to, in the first year, how many properties did you accumulate? We, uh, I did 12 properties. In 12 first properties year. in first year, right? First, year. first two properties, I still remember, took six months. Yes. And then the next eight took six months, right? It's basically uh, every month or every month and a half, we, these are small properties, so the rehabs were not that long. And uh, uh, you can you can fix the properties within like two or three weeks. So we are talking about all these small townhouses at this moment. But uh, we could able, I, mean, I could able to do like almost 12 houses in 12 months. So about 12, 13 months, you were able at about 12, 13 houses. Now at that time, uh, because this is key, right, to what you did and how you were actually able to retire. The money that you had coming in from I mean, 10 houses, you had a good amount of, if you wanted to go out and buy a, you know, a big BMW, a big Mercedes, or go buy a bigger house, sure. you could have, yeah. you didn't do that. No. What did you do with the cash flow? Extra money, three, 4,000 that were coming in every single month. Yeah. It's a discipline about keeping the money in the business, uh, especially when the business is growing. And that's when, it kind of shifted from my investment approach to a business approach around that time. Now this is becoming a, a good business. So now you want to do the profit loss kind of thing, which which was in my mind already as an engineer. Uh, I was doing that uh, at my at my uh, at my job as a, a project engineer. I was managing a business. So my whole thing is the all the cash flow. You don't want to get in cash flow crunch. All that money comes in. You have to invest back again. Either you have to pay off the mortgages or you buy more properties. That point of time when the market was uh, friendly enough to buy the properties for buyers, I just started buying, whenever I accumulate enough cash flow, buy one property with it. And then just keep adding the portfolio. So basically you were buying, rehabbing, renting, refinancing, and just continue to do that and not use the cash flow for not anything enough. except buying a property or uh, putting it back into the property. And yeah, that's, it, that's it, right? So you go, you kind of scale up in about two years or two, two and a half years to about 20 properties. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you basically pretty much said, hasta la vista to the job. 
exactly. right? That was when you were able to retire. Now, most people think that when somebody retires, they quit. They don't do anything, right? That's yeah. the definition of retirement. We use the definition of retirement a little bit differently, right? To us, a retirement income is enough income, right? Plus 20% to replace your job and then some, but not start living on that income, but keep doing something else on the side, right? right? So you, you replaced your day job by doing flips. Exactly. So why not at that point, when I mean, you could have at that point decided, well, every year I'm just gonna buy two, three more rentals and just live on the income. Why did you choose not to do that? It was too good to be true. All the numbers were so nice. Uh, why to stop? Uh, the whole point of quitting job is giving more time to develop this end of the business. That so is. this was your passion, basically. Right, exactly. You found finally, yeah. um, you know, after what, 15 years, 18 yeah. years, uh, your passion, and that's kind of what you've pursued. Right. So now you can actually uh, work for yourself. Uh, you don't have to worry about the job going every day there and uh, uh, doing the things which you don't like to do and your superior wants that, so you do those things. And those are the things I was trying to run away anyways. And this was my great opportunity that I can get into this thing. Even if I don't accumulate more properties, I have enough money to pay my bills. So what's the worry? So that was the thinking process. So let's fast forward that. So initially you said you started with small condos, small townhouses, mm -hmm. right? Today you have a portfolio of over, I think 140 properties or maybe even more, right? Um, today somebody looks at you and is like, oh my God, man, mm -hmm. right? We call you the king of cash flow, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, it's kind of fun, but people don't see those years, yes. right? People don't see how tough it was at that time because every dollar counted. Right now, did you continue buying the townhouses? What is your main part of the portfolio today? Uh, no, as you grow into the business, you'll also realize, and this is about the knowledge. Uh, I knew, I didn't have any mentor other than you, and you're growing with me too. And we kind of started realizing that uh, if you the return on your money in Chicago type of market is best in the single family houses, single townhouses, family. and other things that they're they're good, but they have uh, there are more interactions here too because of the housing or uh, the associations there. Uh, the people you get there are a little bit uh, challenging. As you get into the single family houses, the demographic you're working with is more stable. Um, so there's a, there's a tendency of people living there longer and that's what you want for your rental portfolio. So we kind of switch from the smaller uh, townhouses to the single family. Uh, and there are a bunch of those here. In the Chicago market, it's like full of single family houses. So we that's the other thing, that's the stock was good too. And uh, that's why we switched to those. So <clears throat> would it be kind of accurate if I said, say about 90% of the portfolio today would be single families, right? Now you have some multifamilies yeah. and they're also two to, th uh, two to four flats basically. Yes. Yes. But mostly it's all single families. Yeah, it's like, uh, that's what my, my goal right now is to, uh, make my portfolio robust. So the things which we did initially, not that those are wrong or anything, but that was the only thing we could, we could do with the resources we have. Now the way we are developed our business and we have more resources at our, uh, our side, we can actually have a lot of money. Uh, we are getting a lot of properties. We are getting uh, rehabbing uh, uh, rehabbers who can who wants to work on. So we just have more to work with instead of what we had last time. So my focus is to replace those assets with the asset which I think is the best for renting uh, and make it robust and robust. So let me ask you this. Today, um, we're in a market which is hot, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people are having difficulties finding properties, yes. right? So since 2011 versus today, these are two completely opposite markets. Yes. Are you having any problems finding properties today? No, not no. in our market, no. It, what has changed is you have to change your thinking. It is all about numbers. The, the properties, still people say, okay, I cannot find property because they're looking in the wrong price range. I used to buy properties in, uh, in uh, nicer towns at 70,000. Now I'm buying at 110, but the back end value has gone up too. So you have to adjust your numbers as the market is changing, you have to change too. Uh, the only thing you need to focus on is your mon uh, is your uh, uh, return on your investment. So ROI, we say how much money you're putting in the property or in the investment and how much you're getting back. That's the only f only thing counts. Doesn't make so, a difference where you buy. So let's put this in numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So for your portfolio, right? Now today at Chicago RIA, 
what you talk about, what you talk about during mastery, right? Uh, for somebody who's getting started versus at your level, mm -hmm. right? So let's talk your level numbers mm -hmm. today. Cash on cash on a rental property that you consider a good quality property, right? What is the rate of return you're seeing today? If I'm looking for my portfolio, I'm looking at 30% cash. Minimum. Cash. Minimum. That's for, minimum. For me, because, oh. because I'm invested in this completely. So 30%, if I'm putting $100,000 a year in this business, I need to get back $30,000 that year. Minimum. Minimum. Okay. So now for an average person, let's say, that starts, that comes to Chicago Ria, mm -hmm. right? That's some of the people have been featured on, um, you know, Real People, Real Deals. And for them, what is a good return? So if anybody asks me, okay, what you can make from this business and what I should buy, I would say 20% is what your basic or, or the bottom line number should be. Um, and there's not many investment here, you know, uh, which I at least know we can make 20%. Real estate can still consistently, real estate can still make 20% and it's easy. Today's market will support those numbers, no problem. Right. So, so 20 to 25%, yeah. uh, like all day long. Cash on cash. So cash how much money you're investing in the, in the property, if you can invest 100, you make 20, you're golden. Right. So basically the number I think we use is about 20 to 25% all day long, yes. still today in a market like yeah. that. And then obviously you're, you're not buying at a market, you need to have some equity because that's your exit strategy. Basically, if something happens to market, market goes down, you don't want to become upside down. So it's like both the numbers, it's not only just cash flow, but you need to have equity in the property too, uh, around that 20%, 25% equity number uh, when you're getting into a rental property. So um, the question would be this, right? Today, people look at kind of the end of the, you know, a lot of times people will look at people who are successful like mm -hmm. you and they go, oh my God, right? Man, Rahul has it made now. Right, uh, you have them on a property. So when you have problems, right? It's it, like if you run a business, there are issues, right? Just before we started the interview, uh, you talk about a property in Streamwood, right? There's an eviction going on. I mean, that's just a fact of life, yeah. right? I um, mean, you have hundred houses, you're gonna have one or two evictions. Yeah. But in general, for somebody who's starting today, right? They say, um, I don't have a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? Or I don't know where to find houses. What do you say to these people? Well, the <clears throat> the whole point of having Chicago Ria was that you want to come to a place where people are thinking uh, about real estate and they are giving right information uh, and not just bragging about the things which are not there. So uh, education is the main thing. You need to get yourself educated. And the second thing, you need to get to a place where people are actually helping each other to grow uh, and there's a good information source. Uh, the whole 257 came into that because of that. Because if somebody comes to me or you today and say, okay, how many houses you have? We said 200 plus. They just can't relate that number. And I, I would be in the same position if I, if I see you today and ask you that question, where I should start? You have 200 houses. I just can't do 200. So 257 was kind of a number which we want people to... Uh, uh, look at because it's attainable. It's like a smart goal. I'm a six sigma black belt, so I always think about a, a, when you put a goal for yourself, it should be something you can achieve in a relatively small time frame. So 257 came that in two years, you can buy five properties. Uh, and if you, if you do the exact same thing what I did, that not uh, using that money for anything on your personal side, you can pay it off in yeah, seven to nine. Seven, seven to nine years, depends on how much you're borrowing because everybody has a different uh, number in uh, they can put in. So that's where you should start. So Rahul, let's talk about funding today, yeah. right? Because that's a big thing for a lot of people that they struggle with funding. They might not have uh, the money that they need or they don't know where to turn for funding. So what do you say to them, somebody looking for funding in today's market? And you're right, for a real estate investor, I hear that all the time, that I don't have money, so I cannot do the transaction. And that's that's totally wrong. Uh, as the market has changed, when I started or we started, the, the, the money was tight. Uh, and we had to go to a lot of banks to get one lender to fund it. Today, it's completely opposite. You have so many sources for funding for a right deal. So the, what is important from the investor point of it is to find a right deal which makes sense. So at that time, right, this is 2011, 
um, when you started buying rent, uh, when you started buying rental properties, mm -hmm. uh, nobody wanted to fund on rental properties, no. right? Even though the prices were great, right. uh, there was just no secondary market available, right? Fannie and Freddie wouldn't fund. No. So at the time, I remember making about 33 calls, sure. right? Uh, to, to 33 different just banks. Just to find one bank. Just to find one bank, yeah. right? So, you know, nowadays, like a lot of people will come up and say, well, you know, you don't understand, Rahul. My yeah. problem is um, I don't have money. I don't know where to start. What do you say to them? Yeah. I mean, I hear that a lot in Ria, like, I don't have money, I can't do it. Uh, but that's wrong. The, the only thing the investor need is a good deal. Um, especially with the market condition which, which we have today. Back when I started, money was tight. Uh, which, like you said, you had to go 44 banks or 34 banks to get one. Nowadays, there's so many different options, but at the same time, there's more options, there's more confusion. And that's the whole point when you said that we get Chicago funding rolling. Uh, the whole point or objective of Chicago funding is to provide the right uh, sources for investors so they don't get into that rat race of finding the best lender out there. So about a year ago, right, uh, we started a company called chicagofunding.org and that specifically caters mm -hmm. to investors, yes. right? So if you are in the uh, Chicago land market especially right, and you're looking for financing on your flips, on your deals, your wholesale, uh, the back end buyer needs funding, your all, all rental you. needs funding, right? Uh, chicagofunding.org, uh, it basically pulls together all the funding sources out there and provides you the best source of funding because the market has changed, right? At one time, it was like you could shop your deal everywhere, you couldn't find funding. Sure. Today, if you have a good deal, you're getting the funding. All you need is a good quality property. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah, exactly. Like, if your deal is good, it'll get funded. There's so many sources right now. You just don't want to spend too much time finding the right source because you want to find your next deal. And that's the whole point of Chicago funding is you should, you'll be sure that you're getting the best deal out there uh, and the best lender out there. Got it. So you've done rentals, right? Uh, then once you quit your job, you started doing a bunch of flips, mm -hmm. right? So what was the reason for doing those flips? Flips was the, I don't want it to touch the money in the uh, rental accounts or rental properties because I want to, uh, that's my retirement. That's my uh, legacy, which I want to keep. And I want to just keep it side. Uh, when I quit the job, obviously I need to pay my bills. So the only reason I, I want to flip is only to get enough money to live on. Okay, that's, that's so the, basically that's, rental money, you never touch, period. Yes. Right, even though it's there, you don't touch it. And then um, a couple of years ago, you started making a transition from doing flips to doing wholesales. Yes. What was the reason for that change? Like in every market or as you grow into, the, uh, into any profession, you get more professional or you get more efficient. Uh, when you start looking at numbers of just flipping property and how many headaches and what can happen with a flip and how many times it can go wrong versus how many times it can go right, uh, the wholesale kind of started coming into picture because with uh, if you know the right location and the right price where you can buy, and that's the expertise we have developed, uh, I can get a lot of properties which people just don't see make sense. So let's talk about numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it will make sense to the audience. Yeah average flip property, mm -hmm. right? For you to consider, and you're talking about properties that are 150, 200,000, 250,000 are properties, yes. right? In six months, what is the average perfect flip by your consideration in terms of profit? So in that 200, 250, we are looking at $30,000. 30,000 right? bucks. Around that number, that's the, that's so the in six board. months, but that's your net profit. You're paid off everything, and that's coming to your pocket. So net uh, net profit about thirty thousand bucks, or so thirty to thirty five yes. has been your net number, yes. right? Now with wholesales, mm -hmm. right? With a flip, it's going to take a six month six time months. frame, right? Right. Whereas with the wholesale, with four or five hours worth of work done, right? Right. How much would you say is the average wholesale profit? I would say in Chicago market, in the in the no no, I'm talking about your numbers. No, my numbers, it's anywhere from like. 5 to 15. So right, you're 15, averaging 000. at 10,000 and maybe you can do that in, in a day or two. Right. So the, the point was that wholesaling became a lot more efficient right. for you to do, hence kind of the shift in business. Right. More sophisticated way of running the business. Right. Not that you won't do a flip, but a more sophisticated way. Mm -hmm. If you ask me in real estate, what is most difficult task? Uh, people sell wholesale as the no credit, no money and do wholesale. That's okay, but then you need to know everything. 
running a wholesale is so difficult and when people start doing it they just have no clue and they lose a lot of money uh, on doing that so that's like expert only people who are expert knowledge can do that and once you have that that's that's golden that you can cool. get a lot of money makes sense so i want to kind of go back as we before we wrap up right mm -hmm. because today looking at kind of the whole picture from chicago ria chicago funding uh, to the business uh, you know that you have mastery and all this um, it's it's overwhelming for somebody looking at it and somebody says well you know uh, rahul had it easy mm -hmm. what do you say to them there's nothing easy in this life uh, and i'm just fortunate to have all this thing and uh, what happened in last 6 years from not having a single house to now owner of 140 houses with all these businesses it just i never thought of so i'm really fortunate but again um, I, I guess i'll go back to 99 uh -huh. right coming to america was that easy no that was right. difficult decision to come so, also i guess let me ask this do you come from a wealthy family in india no no it's like i said we were okay but like going for a vacation is a planning of six months, that kind of family. So it's not like I'm coming from a family which has a lot of money to support me. Uh, so everything was done based on uh, the work, discipline, knowledge that I gained throughout these years. So 99 wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. Getting laid off was the, the, the most difficult day in my life to tell that to my wife, who's coming to America for the first anniversary. And on that day you're saying, okay, I, I don't have my job. Okay. So, and as you move towards, you know, kind of quitting your job, right? Um, what was that step like at that time, making that decision? You have a full time job, right? And this kid, crazy Andrew has buying you a bunch of houses, right? Um, what was that decision like? Well, this will relate to a lot of people who get a paycheck at the end of the month. It took me a long time to get over that fact that on even if you work or not, on the 31st of the month, the money is gonna show up in your bank account. Uh, with any business, flip or rental or anything, there's no schedule. And you're always on your mind, okay, when that money is gonna show up, uh, is it gonna show up? So it's, it's always that feeling of uh, not stable life. You have to go through that every day. With, especially with the real estate, you're juggling a lot of money. It's like you're buying you're buying one property or buying 10 properties. My problem was juggling $100,000 back in 11 and 12. My problem is $1 million now to, to, to juggle. It's the same problem. It's it's a headache of that um, cash flow crunch. You don't so, want to get into that cash flow crunch. And I mean, I know because a lot of people don't understand that even when you have 15, 20 properties, yes, do you have money? Yes, it's not like you don't have money, but it doesn't suddenly show up like a paycheck no. in your bank account, right? And nobody gets this, but the first two years, you were doing this quote unquote retirement, mm -hmm. right? Where you're not touching any cash flow, right? You didn't have a lot of money coming in. That's the truth. Yes. No. Now in like first two years, even after the, after the, by quitting the job, um, flipping is difficult. You don't just don't know when the money's coming up and whether the prop, the, if the, everything goes right or wrong, uh, some project pro went down, so there was no money. So we have to struggle through the through those months, um, and it, it's it's growing is difficult. But now looking back, it's it's fun. And you know the fun has it's become funny, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the things that initially when you're like, oh my god, I have five properties yeah. and I have no money and you're depressed and you have 10 properties yeah. and you have mo no money and you're depressed and then you realize it's a lifestyle, yes. right? Today, if you stopped this month, mm -hmm. there's a lot of money at the end of the month. Yeah. There's a lot of more money at the end of next month. But today that crash crunch still happens because now you're not just buying one property, yeah. now you're buying every week multiple properties a week. Yes. yes. So like I said, Juggling hundred dollar versus juggling a million dollar. That's the only difference. We're still juggling it's money. It's a number of zeros on that. That's about it. Uh, but like uh, you asked me the question about uh, what <clears throat> what you felt or how, what was difficult. I still go back and my first two transactions, which I did first time. That is the time when I was like, should I do it or not? Should I take that step or not? And that's where you need somebody. You need somebody to hold your hand and say, okay, this is good. 
you can do this thing because I have done this thing or uh, there are so many examples. But that's the point where you are, uh, you're not sure of yourself. It's the fear, it's the scares, unknown. Exactly. And that's where you need somebody besides you. Uh, for us, it was, for me, it was you. Uh, for a lot of mastery people, that's the whole point of mastery. Um, but those are the first few transactions. Once you get over that, things kind of become easy. You get more options opened up for yourself. And then now you have, you have to pick and choose and just choose the right option to get a better transaction. So, uh, that's what you need to get into. So, so the first few you would say were the most difficult ones. Yeah, yeah. got Just it. Those. As we wrap this up, anything final words you want to share with everybody? No, it's uh, from my story. Uh, everything is possible. I and mean, like I, if somebody told uh, somebody is telling me this thing 15 years back that you will be in this situation, it, I would say no. There's no way I can be there after uh, after uh, after 10 years of my life. So. There's always a beginning of for something. You just have to be uh, disciplined about the thing. Uh, when you're growing, you have to make sure you are not uh, going overboard and you are taking the right decisions by choosing the right mentors. Um, and that helps a lot. Just so you just have to be get to to a point where you you're sitting with the right people. Uh, who are giving the right decisions or right uh, right education? So it's so. the right education, right uh, group of people, right uh, right mentors, right business associates, that sort of thing. And then um, I know I've heard you say this uh, a few times, which mm -hmm. is giving back, mm -hmm. right? Today, um, I mean, buying a rental property is it still as exciting as it used to be? No, no, not not for myself. I feel more excited these days if somebody else who just starting and he gets his first property because the joy on their face, I can remember myself buying those first two properties. And that gives me more uh, more pleasure these days than adding extra property in my portfolio. So you're talking from mastery, right? So in mastery, there's what, 400 people now, yes. right? 5,000 plus houses and a lot of, lot of those thousands of transactions you've been a part of. So today you're able to not only say oh look what's possible but yeah. you're able to yeah. contribute back the 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 position you are, i'm in right now to impact somebody else's life is it's is it's it's a great that it's feeling rewarding. it's it's rewarding it's very rewarding so people who are who we met two year three year back had no properties now there are 10 15 30 35 40 properties and that that transformation in them it's it's so so nice to see and then you feel uh, better because you're part of it and because of you, it's and, happening. You know, the exciting part is there's not just one, two, three, or four. There's no. hundreds of them today, exactly. right? So as we wrap this up, we can talk about this forever. Mm -hmm. But as we wrap this up, I just want to thank you uh, for being on Real People, Real Deals. This is Andrew Holmes saying thank you to Raul uh, Vizo. Thanks, and I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs>